Okay, we're recording. Oh, okay. Great. With Janavi on home based DIY production methods and how OSC relates to it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, first, I would like a small introduction from you and then about your project. Small notes to me, yeah. Small introduction. The goal of OSC is to is to develop an open source economy as the ultimate goal but the idea is to open source all the critical infrastructures of civilization to make material security a thing of the past an issue of the past as in addressing efficient distributed production across the globe so that material scarcity is eliminated from being a central force in, in affecting human relations. Things such as war or poverty, those are perhaps 80% of the resource conflicts or the conflicts on this planet are resource based. So our aim is to, by open sourcing critical infrastructure technologies for production, to eliminate that from being a, one of the central themes of human human conflict. We do that by open sourcing hardware technologies because hardware technologies are, are tangible and affect humanity in such profound ways. Okay. Great. So yeah, uh, so we'll continue with validating the context. Yep. Hello. Yes, yeah. okay. yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, your product is designed to be easily produced by non-experts and with low machinery, isn't it? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you go ahead a few of, uh, a few more sentences about this? Like, how how have you uh, confirmed that your product is normally easily ex reproduced by non-experts or with lower machinery or something like that? Yeah. There's a couple of elements. There. One is the design. First of all, you have to have absolutely open source design and good documentation up to things like IKEA style build diagrams for things that could be language agnostic so anybody who doesn't even read a language could follow the instructions. Uh, second is the use of very common tools, common available tools. For example, our tractor or our brick press can be built completely with a welder, drill press, grinder and some hand tools. Third, it would be using commonly accessible off-the-shelf parts wherever possible, as much as possible, not getting into specialized, not neither specialized tooling nor specialized parts. We also do design for fabrication, meaning in how we design it, we make it as easy as possible for the user. Oh, easy in the sense, yeah, this is where we wanted to scale the, how do you define easy, uh, on what terms? Easy is defined on on technical skill level required. Oh, okay. Meaning, design something, for example, things like self-alignment, things like, you have to start with simplified design. You don't put like a lot of curves or complex geometries into an object that has to do a certain function when you can do it in a simple way. No need for that in order to uh, uh -huh. allow more people to build. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was very informative because we were working in the same direction. And the second one is what kind of production environments do you need to make your product in terms of, for example, machines? We're designing the the open source off grid micro factory, which would be a, a four thousand square foot, four hundred square meter facility, which has everything, up to induction furnaces for melting steel to rebuild modern civilization wherever there is a stream of scrap metal to be found. The technologies in there. Why well, I mentioned the welder the grinder, the drill press, and some hand tools as the four items required to build any of our stuff in order to do it efficiently. We talk not about home scale production, we talk about meeting or exceeding in the industry standards. Being more efficient than industrial production, than centralized production by virtue of automation. So things like CNC torch tables, 
CNC milling machines, industrial robots, and other forms of automation are allowed in our system and we open source all of them down to the electronics and the components such as stepper motors, hydraulic motors, power units. Um, the idea is with the 50 Global Village Construction Set machines, all of those are open sourced and readily available wherever you have a stream of scrap metal to be found. Okay, great. And what about the project of Life Track Tractor? Yes. Sorry, say the question again. Uh, uh, what about the life track tractor? The one that I was going through was especially this life track tractor. Yes. And uh, is it also re replicable in different production environments? Wherever you have access to the stock steel and a okay. basic workshop, you can do that. It's largely bolt together construction. And mm -hmm. currently, we buy things off the shelves like the engines, hydraulics. Uh, right now we're at a phase where we buy everything off the shelf from readily sourceable materials. The idea is to do technological recursion, which means that we start making the parts and components ourselves as we increase the machinery set of the 4,000 square foot facility. Great. Okay. So, uh, uh, how far are this, you said you mentioned off the shelf, right? So, how far are the components self I mean, how many of them, what part of them are you making at by yourself? Uh, which part of the parts? Uh, yeah, what, what, um, how, how much amount of the components are you actually self-producing? Okay. Yeah, as far as all the structural, everything outside of things like an engine or a hydraulic motor or a hydraulic cylinder, everything else, the entire mechanical structure, uh -huh. shafts, frames, Everything that supports, you know, wheels, implements, everything that's not, uh, that's basically made of weldable steel metal, steel, yeah. Including also some electronics, like for the brick press, for example, we build our own electronics off the electronic, um, things like DigiKey or Newark Electronics, you buy the electronic components and then you assemble them together. What amount of free knowledge or skills do these people have to have to make all these at by themselves? Um, like electronics and all, you need to have some free knowledge, right? Uh, to make a particular component. Not really, if you're able to follow the instructions. The idea is our instructions are comprehensive enough that if you can follow a step by step, like put this here, put this lead through this hall use a soldering iron. Only thing you have to know is how to use a soldering iron in order to make the electronics. Everything else is assembly. So you can think about it comparable to assembly line workers where um, if you read the instructions it would in principle be sufficient for anybody to do that. So it's anyone who... We're not assuming any skill set for someone who builds it. We also have... We also run workshops where the assumption is definitely no skill. We teach people on the spot when we run the workshops we do extreme manufacturing builds we can build some of our machines over a weekend or over a day using a swarming uh, you know 24 people or so get get around to build a machine in a single day um, there people teach each other and the instructionals in principle get somebody to do that uh, without any external help our goal is actually just to tell you what the limits are our goal is to be able to run an entire audience like for example to build a 3d printer or some small device uh, imagine one person as a workshop leader providing video instructionals and other IKEA style fa instructionals to an entire group and that one person being able to teach a whole audience say a hundred people novices to each build their own 3d printer that's that's the power of documentation and media uh, to, to communicate. Uh, sorry, say that again. Uh, the last part wasn't clear. Some kind of disturbance was there. I couldn't hear your voice completely. Right. The idea is that with 
a high quality of instructionals you're able to take a person who's a novice and take them through rapid learning in order to build something without necessarily having the skills to do so and and we think that is scalable like in our community based production model where we have people building things for example in a large auditorium like a room full of people they could all build it so it's scalable you don't you can't you don't need to build just one you can actually use this as an alternative to mass production in a sense that you if you have good instructionals and a lot of people they can get involved in all of them building those building something that's a complex technological device Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the design principles of whatever you have found while you're replicating your product or if you, when you were adapting your design, what yeah. are the principles that you really followed for this particular project? Design principles? Uh -huh. Simplicity. That actually helped you to make it on a uh, self scale. Like right. Yeah, I mean, the number one thing is taking out all the excess unneeded things so you simplify second you modularize so things come together you can build things as modules that come together very easily so don't build big monolithic items that have a lot of dependencies but build it as a modular system modular design try to break it down into distinct components so that the entire pro product is understandable and clearly goes together so it's not a big mess it's made of pieces that fit together Lego, Lego. Yep. third is scalability in order to make this relevant to different contexts design it such that parts can be enlarged multiplied so the product can be scalable it's also Lego like principle Next one would be a construction set approach to design. Meaning, we don't design one thing, we design a construction set for a bunch of different things, like the tractor. We really call it a tractor construction set because you can build a tractor, a backhoe, a bulldozer, a trencher, any other machine by using similar components that are reconfigured. So we, we treat that as a construction set approach. So those are those would be some of the main features of how you make it simpler for people and of course design it for design for manufacturing meaning you're designing it to be accessible simple common parts um, design with the builder in mind so because I build this stuff I'm interested in making it as simple to build as possible which is the opposite of typical where the designer is not the builder and therefore they don't typically there's a break in that chain where the design is not necessarily easy to, to build because the designer does not care about building that's quite common more sophisticated companies will care about that but in general it's pretty mediocre as far as the industry standards go Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That kind of matches our uh, list of design principles as well. I read out the principles that I identified in my research so that uh, you can give your inputs on it also. Yep. Uh, okay. So, uh, my list starts with the modular design. I was very interested in the power cube thing that you guys used in your product the life track tractor mm -hmm. it was kind of uh, very modular yep and then the second one is the adaptability or versatility in the range of applications like tweak, tweak fit the future needs and ideas like give a scope for further improvisation right like the cedars rototillers or uh, well dr drilling rigs and brick presses that you give an option for all of them right and then uh, the third one is making components attachable and detachable, more or less the Lego thing that you mentioned. Yep. 
and then using the same material through most of the product so that the materials yeah can right so maybe i can add two things another thing that we do is reduce part parts count uh -huh. meaning use one component that can serve 10 functions as opposed to using 10 different components so that's that part and the last one being lifetime design but that's a byproduct of using modular design with common parts is that you can recycle a certain component forever or replace it because it's easy to to procure Mm -hmm. and then choose substitution or swap a component or a subsystem to reduce the complexity yep like hydraulic drive you used a hydraulic drive instead of an entire diesel engine by doing that you actually eliminated the transmission clutch differential drive and all with a normal hydraulic flow valves and actuators exactly yeah and then the next one is the scalable functionality that you already mentioned. And uh, general purpose and using of general purpose and standard components so that it can be easily DIY. Yep. And reduce the number of uh, different vitamins in the product and try to use the same several times. Right. Vitamins is a term that we identified when we were researching uh, about this another product called Riprap Mental Machine, the 3D printing machine. Yes. So vitamins are those components that we normally uh, use multiple times. They cannot be made, but they can only be bought mostly. Right. Yeah. So reducing the number of different vitamins and using the same one many times. That's you right. You also had a similar idea. And to emphasize that point, uh, I will, since you mentioned hydraulics, hydraulics are used yeah. in the tractors. They're used to power the brick press. And we're also going to do hydraulic CNC machines for heavy-duty milling, as well as things like the heavy-duty industrial robot that's going to be hydraulically driven as well. So the hydraulics are a very versatile form of uh, power transmission. And let me give you another radical example. The same hydraulic wheel rotor that drives the wheels, it's a modular component. If you put that on a tower, and attach windmill blades to it, it turns into a hydraulically driven windmill. So a windmill that spins a hydraulic rotor that then generates power through hydraulic fluid. So we're really going, um, I mean as a whole set, as time goes on, we are modifying the set to, to keep the lowest number, lowest part count possible as the entire set which is also something that's hard for new developers to understand because they're interested in developing one machine. They're saying, why are you doing that? And I tell them, you're not designing one machine, you're designing an ecosystem of machines. And that's a lot of times we get friction with that because people are saying, why are you doing that? They don't necessarily understand the bigger context, which is something we have to train people to, to, to respect as far as the product ecologies are involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, the next part in our this thing principles was the different depths of DIY, like building a whole machine bit by bit or uh, buying a complete functional printer. It, it just varies from building from scratch and just buying many products and just assembling them. Right. That's the next one. And then uh, uh, many components in your uh, uh, product also can be bought. Isn't it? They need not be made completely at home. Right. We're designing that for both options. You can either oh. build it yourself or you can you can buy it so it's a resilient system. If you have less resources and you've got you can build it, it'll take you more time, but you'll have it for lower cost perhaps. Mm -hmm. okay. And then using a
let's quit and let's try that again. Okay, can you hear me now? Hi. I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, was there some weak connection or something? Uh, yeah, probably weak connection. Uh, okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, further in, uh, according to our discussion. Oh, there I am. Yeah. Now my now my video showed up. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, we were actually discussing, do you actually change some configuration using the same design elements in your project? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's, so that's your the... idea. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, the idea is that the multi-purpose flexibility comes from reusing the same parts. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like... Yeah, it's like having the same uh, uh, raw material but making it different. Yes. Isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So the next one is customizable do it yourself. Uh huh. Uh, like it's almost similar to the different depths of DIY. Yep. Yeah. And then, now, uh, oh. Uh, yeah, the next one is replacing materials with discarded materials or design for the usage of discarded and easily accessible materials. Well, for us... Meaning focusing on... No, we don't do that so much. We don't, like, there's a, the oh. school of thought where people go to the junkyard. While that's way to recycle resources, our we prioritize replicability which means that if you're going to rely on discarded sources that are irregular or not the same then you cannot achieve kind of predictability of production so if you can source a very an absolutely identical thing from a junkyard like for example a one inch shaft you know and that's just the one inch shaft yeah that will work but if you talk for example about some hydraulic motor no we need to have an identical hydraulic motors with replicable sourcing, otherwise they don't work. It's too hard to adapt them to the to the machine. You have to start with, with predictable, well-defined parts. Otherwise, for engineered devices, they're not gonna work. You're gonna get substandard performance. Or you will increase your build time significantly because for example Yeah, or the build time will increase significantly when you're trying to mount, for example, a hydraulic motor and the bolt pattern is completely different and that means you have to rework that completely and that can take you a day, you know? Yeah, we, yeah. And we talk about, so, so we design... It will be a compromise on precision. Yeah, we can't compromise on it. But you have to include that the, our build method, which, which our build method is extreme manufacturing meaning that we have a swarming build with a lot of people where we build things in a single day. That means our production efficiency is radically, uh, radically fast. And actually, if we go through some of the numbers, the amount of time it takes us to build a tractor, which is one day, that's faster than Mahindra and Mahindra tractors. We actually have less uh, human labor involved in our process compared to the, the largest manufacturers in the world. Uh, which is why we think this kind of production model uh, can be more more prevalent in the future. Okay. Yeah. That kind of explains one of our points. Yep. Okay. This part should have flexibility to be handled, moved, or transported without tools or with handheld and non-specialized tools. Transportability. Basically, how easily can the product be transportable also designs decides how far it is do it yourself doesn't it yeah for us if we're talking about a heavy machine you need another machine to move it if you for example like the brick press the brick press so far we haven't designed it on a trailer so in order to move it you need a forks on a tractor to move it from place to place but otherwise because it's designed for disassembly so that's another principle I didn't really mention, but design for disassembly is part of the features. 
you can collapse it into a onto a pallet for transport a three by three by six foot pallet the entire brick press which is more like uh, three by three by three meters because I can't hear your voice completely. Yeah. I um, guess it's a network. Yeah, network. Maybe we, you want to turn off the the video, maybe? Might be better better connection. Yeah, yeah. But um, idea is, because of design for disassembly, we can collapse our machines into a small packing fraction for transportation. So okay. you can fit the entire brick press on a pallet, on a 3 by 3 by 6 foot pallet whereas the machine is more like six by six by six feet. So compress the volume down like a factor of eight times or so. So basically uh, it is about going down in the scalability, isn't it? What do you mean by that? Like uh, making the products more smaller so that they can be easily transported. Right, the design for disassembly allows you to pack the products into a small small package. Uh, okay. In okay. fact, the thing I keep referring to is that the entire Global Village construction set, all the machines would be able to fit in a 40-foot shipping container for, for deploying in remote locations if needed. Okay. So this is indirectly related to the principle of uh, modularity and uh, Lego-like thing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So uh, the next uh, principle that we identified was adding symmetry in design to reduce the diversity in parts. Absolutely. This too? Yes, yes, we do. Symmetry wherever possible is a desired feature, and it's very explicit in some of our products. Okay. Yep, and that's a that's simply a good design principle. A lot of commercial products do not have a large degree of symmetry. We try to maximize it. Okay. So that actually enables uh, better do it yourself than uh, uh, normal designs without the symmetry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, I think so the. Glass? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think the end goal of uh, the, the possibility is that the products are equal or better than industry standards. It's just a matter of design. So. Uh, a lot of people might think that DIY stuff is inferior. Well, it is if you don't have proper design. But once you develop the design and that's that's propagated across the world, I believe that the product quality in general of things, of built artifacts, is going to in increase as open source and DIY design takes off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Design principle is reducing the number of reciprocating parts to simplify the design. Yeah, yep. Uh, once again, keeping keeping the number of moving parts to a minimum is a good idea. Okay, so you use that in your product too? Yeah, for example, with hydraulics, you eliminate the entire transmission chain, and we try to design things like, for example, by articulated steering of the tractor. You're eliminating the steering column and turnable wheels, which have a lot of moving parts in them. So articulated steering on a tractor is a way to do away with many parts and simplify the steering mechanism. Okay. Yeah. Sort of explains. Mm-hmm. So uh, the next part is the challenges. What limits you uh, in designing a product that can be easily reproduced? Like the constraints regarding functionality, tolerances, lack of skills? Uh, the limiting factor is access to the open source high power production machines that enable industrial level of quality, high level of quality. So that means uh, I believe in the use of CNC machines and automation to get the desired precision and, and all the kinds of parts on a very small scale. So. The limit right now is the availability of high performance production machines and of the open source design for the, that uses these high quality machines. That to me is the is the block. That is the main thing. Yep. 
but how do you normally overcome these nowadays? Now that you don't have these hyper access to these hyper production machines, how do you overcome this? We're building them or outsourcing. So, for example, to date, um, we have outsourced most of the CNC cutting of parts for the tractor. No, just for the, yeah for the tractor brick press. We outsource mo most of it. We've done some cutting in house, but we're working on the next iteration of the CNC torch table. And for example, with 3D printing, we are able to get those high, uh, those nice parts with the advent of 3D printing. That's that's doable. But as far as doing things like we want to make our hydraulic motors and engines, well, we can't yet because we don't have the open source industrial machines, the CNC mills, or other tools, or precision grinders that will allow us to do that in an open source way so we have to buy those right now okay so it's nothing but coming down to the limitation of tools yes it is okay. because those tools exist on a very small scale and it's quite doable in a small production facility the, the problem is that they don't exist um, and, a, and a fab lab has not helped the fab lab concept from mit has continued to rely on proprietary hardware which is uh, the next iteration to that, uh, which we're actually working on with a student, a PhD student who's working on the Green Lab, which is the open source off-grid microfactory. And that will include 100% open source tool chains for everything. And that's the critical missing piece to, to making DIY production much more powerful. So yeah, those were the principles that we had identified. It almost tallies with all the principles of yours, except for the one or two or one or two. Mm -hmm. And then it was very good talking to you yeah. and getting to know your project. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I can send you this recording if you like. Um, yeah, I will do that. And uh, that's is that all for the questions then? Yeah, uh, I'll extract the necessary points and keep you posted okay. about the developments in my project. And then I'll send you a copy of it by the end of the design guide. Great. I look forward to that. So, yeah. yeah. Good luck on your project then. And, uh, yeah, Thank I look forward. Okay. Thank you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.